welcome back to the Back to Space News Flash. I'm Danielle Dallas Russa, and don't go away because we have an exclusive patch for the Apollo 12 anniversary, and we'll be announcing the winner of last week. So stay tuned. Okay, before we get into it, I just want to let you know that my Lyft driver this past weekend was a flat earther. I knew that that was a thing, but then I was like, it can't be a thing. And then I was like, oh my God, it's actually a thing. She told me she didn't believe in gravity, which I didn't even know was subject of, of debate. And anyways, I guess I just like really needed to talk to someone about it. And I thought maybe y'all were the right group. And I don't know, I just- yeah, focus. Oh, yes, sorry. I thought I was in therapy for a second. Let's get started with the Back to Space news. <laughs> On Friday, November 15th, two astronauts took one of the most complicated spacewalks in NASA history. The mission is to revive a little sick experiment on the ISS. This is gonna be one out of four spacewalks to repair this thing. So the two astronauts are Luca Parvitano, a European astronaut, and an American astronaut, Andrew Morgan. They were expected to spend 6.5 hours working outside the orbiting lab on the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, known as the AMS. So just as some background, the AMS has been a part of the ISS exterior since it was installed in May 2011. It was designed to last for at least three years. It was relying on a set of four cooling pumps to keep the system cool. Then two of those pumps failed in 2014. Penn Bullweg, the AMS program manager said, we knew we had to do something about it, especially since AMS was getting such compelling science. We knew we wanted to extend its life. So what is the science we're getting from this thing? Funny you should ask because I was wondering too. So the AMS is studying unique environment of space to advance knowledge of the universe and lead to a better understanding of the universe's origin. So basically this is a sophisticated cosmic ray detector designed to seek out antimatter and dark matter. Okay. Japan didn't go to Jared's, but they do have a big rock. <laughs> that was terrible. Japan's second asteroid sample mission named Hayabusa 2 is heading home after a very nice vacay on the asteroid Yugu, packed with precious space rocks, souvenirs, that scientists are literally dying to get their hands on. It was launched in December 2014 after more than a year packed full of work at the rocky asteroid. Mission scientists will now have to wait for another whole year to get back to Earth. It should touch down in the Australian outback. O Australian outback. Is that British? I can't do it. So stay tuned for uh, more of the studying of these materials. So guys, this is a little bit of a pickle we're in. Remember when we reported about Elon Musk's Starlink, where he was launching 60 Starlink satellites into space? Then in October, he tweeted through the space via the Starlink satellites. So SpaceX was requesting permission from the Federal Communications Commission to operate as many as 30 thousand satellites on top of the 12,000 already approved. That sounds like the future, but also that sounds like a huge problem to many astronomers. James Lowenthal, an astronomer at Smith College, saw the train of Starlink satellites marching like false stars across the night sky, and he was like, whoa, hold up. I do not feel great about this. He said, and I quote, I felt as if life as an astronomer and a lover of the night sky would never be the same. And if thousands more of these things get launched, he said, it will look as though the whole sky is crawling with stars. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's the Elon Musk satellites. Since May, the American Astronomical Society has convened an ad hoc committee with Dr. Lowenthal and other experts to discuss their concerns with SpaceX representatives once a month. At the same time, SpaceX has been working with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory to jointly minimize potential impacts of Starlink satellites on radio wavelengths that astronomers use. But somehow, none of these conversations focused on light pollution. What? How? So now we got another doctor up in here, Dr. Tyson, who is the chief scientist for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, a 27 foot billion dollar telescope under construction in Chile that will scan the entire night sky every three days. And it will help the astronomers get a better understanding of dark energy and dark matter, the origin of the Milky Way and the outer regions of the solar system. But because it is designed to scan faint objects, it is expected to be greatly affected by these satellites. Whenever a satellite photobombs a long exposure image, it could cause a bright streak of light that can cross directly in front of an object astronomers wish to observe. Quote, if there are lots and lots of bright moving objects in the sky, it tremendously complicates our job, Dr. Lowenthal said. It potentially threatens the science of astronomy itself. Dun -dun -dun -dun. So 
we basically need to find a common ground here. They actually tried to uh, paint the satellites and they were like, nah, that's not going to work because we're still going to see it. So at least SpaceX is trying to find a common ground. Ever get hungry and you're like, wow, I want a cookie. I do. And so do astronauts. So what do they do when they have a, a sweet tooth in space? I read the story and was like, oh, this is super cute, but also super random. So Doubletree by Hilton is famous for handing out freshly baked cookies at its hotel, which is true. I have done it many a times, many more than I would like to account or count. But they sent over a specially designed space oven and cookie dough, and they sent it to the ISS to make the world's first cookie baked in space. Ha! And then the article talks about how awesome Doubletree is. They literally say, Houston, we have a cookie. But it's, it's actually pretty cool. I mean, it's just super random that it's not Toll House or like Pillsbury, but it's Doubletree. We live in confusing time, but go cookies! Yeah! Now we're moving on to the past. On November 14th, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 12 launch. Little known fact, well, probably not for this audience, y'all know everything. Apollo 12 launched for the moon, everything was going swimmingly, and then it got struck by lightning seconds after the rocket lifted up. The astronauts on board, which included Commander Pete Conrad, Lunar Module Pilot Alan Bean, and Command Module Pilot Dick Gordon, noticed a bright flash, but they were like, nah, we're good. So they keep going on. They were set for landing on the moon's ocean of storms four days later. Then Pete and Alan made the first landing and arriving within distance of the Robotic Surveyor 3 spacecraft, which landed on the moon in 1967. And Dick Gordon remained in orbit, taking photos of the moon. Unlike a lot of events we are celebrating this year surrounding the 50th anniversaries, unfortunately, none of the Apollo 12 crew members are still alive to celebrate their own milestone. So rest in peace, Apollo 12. Thank you for all you did, and we're excited to celebrate the 50th. Speaking about Apollo 12, we have to do the giveaway from last week and then this week. So first, let's discuss the winner of last week. Last week, we are giving away the t-shirt that I'm wearing in every episode, not today because I couldn't find it, but it is an amazing, state-of-the-art, back-to-space shirt. So, without further ado. JWW, you won! Yeah, you getting that t-shirt. So we're gonna go ahead and send an email to info at backtospace.com or we'll reach out and um, you're gonna wear it. Make sure you tell all of your friends because it's pretty cool. <laughs> this week, we have a very unique Apollo 12 patch. It is actually signed by the artist. If you want to enter to win this, please make sure that you do the following steps. One, you are a subscriber of this magnificent channel. Two, you like this video. And three, you leave a comment below. Preferably nice, but you know what? As long as you're subscribed, it's fine, I guess. It just makes me cry at night. Okay, and now, the future. Mars 2020 rover was moved into a vacuum chamber and tested under Mars-like environmental conditions to prepare for its launch to the red planet next summer. This super cool time-lapse video shows engineers at NASA's JPL in California moving the rover into the chamber. Like the Chamber of Secrets, but it's the Chamber of Mars. After the rover was tested in the vacuum chamber, it was then moved back to JPL's spacecraft assembly facility. The engineers began radio emission testing on the spacecraft. The rover is scheduled to launch from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida in July 2020. Mars 2020 will land inside the red planet's Yezero crater on February 18th, 2021. While well, it will search for habitable environments and evidence of past microbial life. Where are you? Testing the rover in a Mars-like environment will help prepare the Mars 2020 operation team for the mission. In August, a NASA-funded project called Sandy Semi-Autonomous Navigation for Detrial Environments tested Martian rover and drone prototypes on lava fields in Iceland to simulate the difficult terrain that spacecrafts will encounter on the red planet. So if y'all haven't heard about this James Webb Space Telescope, you need to ASAP because it feels like NASA has been building it for 400 years. Um, here's a photo of me as an intern. It was just yesterday because I'm so young. Anyways, it's due to launch in March 2021 and the project has a tiny little price tag of $9.6 billion. So when it's all said and done and you know, in orbit, I made that sound so easy, it will be able to capture the far reaches of space. 
in unprecedented detail. NASA recently tweeted a photo of the satellite this week to illustrate just how massive it is. A man is on this cherry picker and it still only reaches about halfway up. Seeing how amazing Hubble has been, I can only imagine how fabulous this telescope will be and how much it's going to make all of our brains want to explode. Because what is space? Space, y'all. Space. Like I said, we live in weird times. So politics aside, the Air Force is gonna have to change the way it does business to fight the growing threat to the nation's dominance of space. The long-held dominance which helps establish U.S. supremacy on the battlefield via unmatched reconnaissance and communication capabilities is being challenged like never before. This has been communicated by Air Force officials last week during the first ever Air Force Space Pitch Day. Air Force personnel basically said that China and Russia are making anti-satellite weapons. That's not good. Mm -mm. Sean Barnes, Deputy Principal Assistant for the Secretary of the Air Force for Space, voiced similar sentiments. I am concerned because we are so dependent on space-based capabilities, and yet we know that our adversaries is working to take those capabilities away from us, either physically or virtually. Those adversaries are working fast, bringing new space technologies online every three years or so. So um, this was added by Michael Dickey, director of the, hang on, this is quite a title, Enterprise Strategy and Architecture's Office and the Air Force Space Command Chief Architect at Air Force Space Commander Headquarters at P Peterson's Air Force Base in Colorado. Did I copy and paste that wrong or is that actually the title? The industry age acquisition process the U.S. Air Force has traditionally used to get new and needed tech in orbit by contrast takes about 15 years from start to finish, said Dickey, who was on the same panel as Barnes that we just discussed. So by the time I get once every 15 year election cycle, I'm working on the wrong problem four times removed, he said. That's kind of where we are right now and we have to catch up. Run, Forrest, run. And the best way to do that is ha to have an audience like you guys that is actively engaged in what is going on in our space news and also encourage our young people to pursue STEM. But the more that we can be on top of it, the more change that we can make. Wow. Our shout out for this week is Space Channel. I did a super fun video with them about the hottest topic of conversation in space, astronomy versus astrology. It was so fun. They were so great to work with and also to the internet. It's astronomy and astrology. We like all of them. We were just having some fun, but go and watch it because it was a great time. Also some business stuff. Back to Space is now doing crowdfunding. Most YouTube channels are funding themselves through Patreon. And while we probably will do that eventually, we are an entrepreneurial endeavor and would love to have some of our subscribers as actual owners. Beginning next week, we will be running a Reg C F campaign where you can actually buy stock in Back to Space using WeFunder. If you want to learn more about that, just click the link below in the show more section. Okay, enough business. Our student researcher for this week is Becca Blum. She lives in a geodesic house and loves to stargaze with her grandfather. She loves biology and her dream is to be the first person on Mars. She's gone to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama five times and she is an astronaut in training with Project Possum. She is going to be the kind of kid to help us get in the lead again full space. That's it for this week's news flash. Don't forget guys to leave a comment, subscribe and like our video because you know what? This is a once in a lifetime Apollo patch and it's signed by the artist. You want it, I know you do, don't lie. Anyways, see you guys later, until next week.